Hey you, welcome back. This week, I wanted to take a look at a topic that I've wanted to talk about for a while now. And you know what? There seems to be a lot of information out there, including from your favorite YouTubers, probably trying to sell you the definitive, best, most amazing teal and orange cinematic LUTs. I'm not even saying that's necessarily a bad thing, but you gotta admit, it is pretty funny. Okay, so this week we're talking about LUTs. That sounded like so serious, it's just like, on tonight's show, we go deep into LUTs. What are they? Can they be affecting you? Tune in tonight at 9 p.m. for our exclusive coverage. You know, for a moment there, it really sounded like I said sl All right, so what are LUTs? It stands for lookup table. So a LUT is simply a file that tells your program how to transform certain values. Now, in the case of color grading, that's taking one input value and spitting out another input value, like color, for example based on the transform that the lookup table says. It gets a whole lot more complex than that, but we'll just stick with that for now so that you have a basic understanding of how LUTs work. Essentially, it's gonna help map out the image in a particular way that's predefined in the LUT file. Now, there are different types of LUTs and they come in different varieties, and they're also built to accomplish different things. For example, you have a 1D LUT that looks a little bit like this. This tells your program like Premiere or Photoshop or whatever to take an input color and output another value. Now, these types of LUTs run into limitations because they don't hold enough information to do things like film emulations, for example, which are much more complex and involve the colors actually interacting with each other. Those are in the form of 3D cube LUTs, and you'll see that even those can get much more complex as well. So with the limitation of 1D LUTs, that's where 3D LUTs come in. They hold much more information, like I said, and the information within it can be affected in different ways. Now you start getting those interactions because your information's moving in 3D space. So for simplicity's sake, let me show you that visually. Now, if we go into DaVinci Resolve, I can go in and grab a 3D LUT from Resolve, for example. And if we build this out quickly in Fusion and I drop the LUT in, you can see now it gives you a visual representation of the 3D LUT. You have way more values to work with here and it also interacts with hue, saturation, and luminance as well. It does a lot more and holds much more information. The cube can also represent the totality of the color space, for example. That way you can test LUTs to see if they're breaking in any way and reproducing colors outside of your color space. Obviously we don't want that and our transforms and LUTs need to be within the bounds of the color space we're working in. That's much further beyond the scope of this video though. And to be honest with you, even I've just started dipping my toe into that. I just wanted to show you that as a visual representation so you understand what 3D LUTs can be and the complexity that comes with this type of thing. All right, so along with 1D and 3D LUTs, there's also another distinction, and that's between technical and creative LUTs. Some LUTs can also be both. So for example, they can have a technical component, which is a transform, and they can also have a creative component, for example, a film emulation stock. What does that mean? Well, let's take a look in Resolve because there's actually some really great examples with some of the LUTs that are provided in Resolve already. So if we go into the color page here and let's look at this image, for example, it's an airy raw image and it's in a log state. You can tell because we're looking at a flat image, there's no contrast. This was captured straight from the camera. Also, let me know down below if you guys would like a video on like raw versus log versus Rec 709 color space and all that kind of stuff. If enough of you guys want it and you'd find that useful, I'll do a video on that as well. So let me know down in the comments below. Also, this would be a great time to say, if you haven't subscribed already, please hit the subscribe button, hit the like button down below. It helps me get this video out to a lot more people and we're coming up quick on a thousand. So thanks to everyone that's subscribed so far and watched these videos and join the community. So hit subscribe and the like button. So the camera in this image is capturing more than our displays can reproduce. There are different color spaces, but for now just know that if you're putting videos out there on the internet, you're gonna be exporting in Rec. 709 color space. That's the color space your monitor can reproduce more often than not. We need to transform, if you will, to go from what the camera captured that can't be reproduced on monitors to then normalize the image into a space that can be displayed and manipulated on our monitors and also shown on things like TVs, so on and so forth. LUTs can help with that. 
if we open up our LUTs panel here and we go to Ari, we'll see resolve includes a transform LUT from Ari Alexa log C to Rec 709. So it's taking what the camera saw and transforming it into what our displays can reproduce. And it's also adding things like contrast and a little bit of saturation, everything else, right? So that's a technical transform. Now creative transform by itself is still a LUT, but it just doesn't do the technical part. It's only focused on shifting the colors around or giving you a look for lack of a better term, or at least the start of a look. That doesn't mean that it can't add things like a film contrast curve or switch around your colors or add saturation or any of that kind of stuff, but it's not transforming from one color space to another. So like I said earlier, there are also LUTs that do both. They do a technical transform and a creative transform as well. So let's look at that. If we look in Resolve, a good example of this is the film looks LUTs that are included. So let's reset the node here and keep using this image. If we go to the LUTs folder again and find the film looks, there are several here and they expect different things. For example, if we scroll down to the Kodak LUTs and hover here, we can see it's transforming to Rec 709, which is our output color space for the web, and applying the Kodak 2383 film print creative transform as well on top of the conversion. Now, what's it converting from? Or in other words, what does the LUT expect? It expects a film log curve, which is Cineon film log. That's a log curve modeled after film, to put it simply. And that's what these LUTs are expecting going in. So if your image isn't in Cineon film log, and then you apply this, it's gonna look a little off. And depending where, where your image started from, it could look a lot off as well. And I'll show you that in a minute. Right, so that brings us to our next topic. Sometimes you run into some technical issues with LUTs and as filmmakers, we have to know what was this LUT built for? Is it a technical transform LUT? a creative LUT, or is it both? If it's technical or both, then what does the LUT expect as an input? What color space or gamma was it designed to accept? And then what's it going to spit out? This becomes very important when you're color managing, and that's my number one tip you've probably heard me talk about on this channel especially. Color management is the foundation of everything that I do. All of my shots start off properly color managed first. So in this shot, if I was color managing, for example, let's reset it again and go do my basic color management. If you don't know what this means, there are videos here on the channel introducing color management. I'll link them up top and also down in the description below. Go watch those and let me know if you guys want more videos on that as well, because there's always lots to talk about in terms of color management. But in settings, we'll go to color management and then I'm going to go through these quickly, but don't be overwhelmed. I promise these aren't hard. They just look very complicated. My other video explains all of these as well. Just for the sake of this video though, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. We want to go for color managed, right? So then un I'm gonna uncheck automatic because we want to input this in ourselves and then we want to go custom. So all of these things pop up here, which we're gonna fill in. Input, I'm choosing Airy Log C since that's what our footage is. I'm outputting to Rec 709 Gamma 24, so we'll leave that there. And we wanna work with DaVinci Wide Gamut. It's a really good, very broad color space. So I wanna map the airy footage over to that. Now we can see we're color managed and the image has been technically normalized, right? It looks like we got the contrast back again, all that kind of stuff. So now let's put the LUT back on the footage. Uh oh, all right, so looks really bad, right? Why is that? Well, the LUT was built to accept a certain input and we're not giving it that. So now it's almost like we're applying two transformations on this image, which isn't good. We have our color managed transformation, which is saying, you know, go from this to our working color space, which is DaVinci Wide Gamut, to outputting Rec 709. And then the LUT saying, you're supposed to be giving me Cineon Film Log, so I'm gonna do the conversion to Rec 709 again as well as part of the LUT. So you have two Rec 709 conversions happening. So all that to say, if you have LUTs you're working with already and you start color managing properly, then they might not work in this environment. So knowing the technical specifications of your LUTs is very important. I'll tell you right now, definitely not all LUTs are good LUTs. What does that mean? Well, there's professionals like, for example, like Company 3, they have color scientists that build LUTs from scratch and these things are meant to do technical 
transforms, creative transforms, all sorts of things, and they build them specifically to the needs of the production. Or if you only need a creative lot, then that's only, they only build that, which could be something like a film print emulation or whatever. A lot of stuff like LUTs that you can get online might not account for that kind of stuff, or they may not be working in color managed spaces, that sort of thing. So those LUTs may not work and they may fall apart, especially if you're learning to color grade. In my opinion, what I think is a better way and your color managing. You always want to make sure that the LUTs that you're using aren't affecting your image in like unintended ways that you don't want, especially when you're trying to put the color into your film or video or whatever. If I use LUTs nowadays in my work, it's usually only creative LUTs to get a creative look. I'm usually not doing the transform through a LUT and there are reasons for that. All of my technical transforms are done with color space transform as part of Resolve and that's the way I like to keep it because I think it's a much better mathematical solution that maps your images over and there's room to do it non-destructively and you still have the wide dynamic range of the captured image to work with. So you Usually I'm only using LUTs from like trusted colorists that I've either built them and tested them or whatever to make sure that they're going to do exactly what I want them to do. Even then I want to make sure that the LUTs I'm using are going to give me the intended results. For example, if I'm working in DaVinci Wide Gamut, I want to make sure that I'm using LUTs that both take DaVinci Wide Gamut so that's what they're expecting and then also return DaVinci Wide Gamut because then it won't mess up my pipeline. All right, last thing we'll talk about real quick, very broadly is why use LUTs in the first place? Well, the short answer is they can be extremely useful. Directors and DPs use them on film shoots or TV shoots all the time so that that way they can take the raw image that the camera's showing, apply a LUT to it, and then they can expose or do things to the image in order to properly shoot for that final image. So getting a good picture of what it's gonna look like in the final process, or at least somewhat close to what it'll look like, allows them to shoot better on set and sort of get an idea of where they're going. You can only stare at a very bland log image for so long before you go, I'm not getting anything out of this. So obviously those are technical transform LUTs as well, and they often include some creative element in there as well. And those are usually built specifically for those productions. So you either work with a color scientist or a, or a colorist right up front to build those show or film LUTs. Second of all, as a colorist, it can be very useful to use LUTs and a huge time saver as well. If I know that I'm gonna apply a certain set of steps every single time I get into an image, especially if the client's willing to go that way, then building a LUT to do all those steps in one can be very useful. For example, if you're always trying to emulate some type of film print stock or film negative stock, then the easiest thing to do would be to build a LUT or get a LUT that does exactly those steps so that you can just apply it and you can have a nice starting point for your grade every single time you get into Resolve. Remember, you always wanna work smarter, not harder. Doing those repetitive steps every single time won't net you the greatest benefit, especially when speed is of the essence and you still want your images to look very good and very professional. Despite there being a lot of very bad LUTs out there, there are also a lot of really good ones. So now you can take this basic knowledge that you've got from this video and determine whether LUTs that are being sold out there are good for your purposes or not. And that can better inform you as to whether you should use them in your project or just skip them. Remember, not every project is gonna need a LUT necessarily. You don't need to go for the film emulations every time. If you're properly color managing your projects, that's a very good starting point. And then you can sort of build off that and manipulate colors all on your own, even without using LUTs as well. And you can get a very cinematic end result. All right, so that's where I'm gonna leave it for this video. I know there was a lot to cover there and this is going to be a very dense video it's okay if you didn't get all of it just go back and re-watch it especially some of the points that maybe you didn't understand or if you want to go over my examples and resolve again there were some really in-depth concepts and trust me it took me a while as well of researching this stuff and looking at it and using it day to day for this to make sense as well it is pretty in-depth once you start getting into like the color science and color look building part of color grading but it's one of the most exciting things that you can learn and i I still have so much more to discover, which is part of why I love doing this. There's always something new to learn, always something new to discover, always something new to make your processes better. So I hope this gave you a really good jumping off point. And if you're just as interested about this stuff or you find it just as interesting as I do, then there are a lot of great resources out there that you can go dive deeper into this stuff. As I learn, I'll definitely make sure to share the knowledge with you guys. So make sure that you're subscribed, leave a like down below as well so that you don't miss any future filmmaking videos. And until next time, Time, go out there and create something 
Lot of a